Hey folks, this is Clayton Collins, your host for the Housing News Podcast and the CEO at HW Media. I know I've said this a few times this year that this is one of my favorite episodes I've ever recorded, but I just got to give credit to our team at Housing Wire who's helping me book amazing guests for this show because once again, I have a, a new favorite episode of, of Housing News. Today's guest is Vadim Verhoglad, the Vice President and Head of Research at DV01. And let me tell you why this episode is so special and why Vadim brought so much value. He is one of the few heads of research and housing professionals that truly understands the housing market from end to end. I could have asked Vadim about any topic in housing from originations to servicing to capital markets to, to tech and fintech trends and regulation, and he would have nailed it. We cover many of those topics in today's conversation and get a glimpse into some of the data that Vadim has used in his career on Wall Street, in research, and in fintech, and how he is supporting the mortgage industry and making better decisions through research and capital markets technology and information. I hope you enjoy this episode with Vadim Raglad, the vice president and head of research for DV01. We may have just gotten back from Gathering of Eagles, but we're not done with events for 2023 yet. This October, we're headed right back to Austin, Texas for Housing Wire Annual, and we want to see you there. We've got a power-packed agenda with content such as our Women of Influence speakers, peak performer playbooks, CEO playbooks, and more to propel your company forward, as well as a bunch of networking events. Because this event is open to real estate executives, mortgage title, and everyone in between, you really have the opportunity to network with people from all across the housing ecosystem. If you want to learn more about the event, or if you're already ready to get registered, head over to housingwire.com on the events tab and you can learn all about it. Not to mention, if you're an HW Plus member, you're going to get 50% off your ticket. So get registered for HW Plus and get registered for the event so we can see you out in Austin. Vadim, welcome to Housing News. Thanks for having me, Clayton. Thrilled to have you. So Vadim, you and I are, are meeting today for the first time, but I've been following DV01 research and reports for, for several years now, but it's been Love through- Love to hear the that. Hey, like I, I'm the, like that silent um, consumer in the inbox, but I've been reading your reports, but it's been through the lens of non-QM. And we at Housing Wire have covered the non-QM market really closely for several years. From time to time, I even personally jump in and write our the non-QM edition of our Lending Life newsletter. And I've often fallen back to DVO one reports to identify trends and, and have great questions to ask people. So thank you for, for those contributions. But doing more work to prepare for this conversation, I realized that DVO1 is much more than, than what I had initially perceived. So I would, I'd love to hear about the business, how you're working with issuers and originators, how you're supporting institutional investors. Give me, give me a glimpse into the role DVO1 plays in the market. Yeah, absolutely. And Clayton, thank you for so much for having me on. Uh, I like to think of DVO1 as truly a hub of bringing in superior data, including data management and quality with a state-of-the-art web application product that allows more people ubiquitous access to that data and pairing that with our market intelligence and insights. So we bring technology, data, and intelligence all into one place that's going to allow both issuers and investors and even new market participants to not feel like they're behind the curve when it comes to entering the structured credit markets. In 2008, we all learned a very valuable lesson, which is if you don't look at the data and you don't get engaged, you can get caught very flat-footed and the results can be pretty drastic. What we, DVO1 was founded off that market, off the lack of data transparency and the lack of ability for everybody to be able to access this information without having a large internal quantitative staff and technology staff that can process reams of data. It was founded from that, that sense. So we started, even though non-QM, as you pointed out, is a big market for us, we actually started in the fintech lending consumer unsecured universe, which has become, you know, has emerged from a fintech product that had naysayers the minute it was created to a fairly mainstay and important part of the consumer arsenal of credit not just for accessing new credit, but really to get themselves on the right side of repairing their balance sheets. Uh, from there, we branched out into mortgages. Uh, then we cover autos and we cover unique sectors like student loans on the private side, solar lending, and then some you, some fairly niche products and mortgages like 
the fix and flip universe and the new age 2.0 HELOCs that have come to the market outside of the traditional bank balance sheet model over the past few years. The HELOC market's been hot. So I imagine that's an area where you're, you're finding some growth opportunity. So let's go through the lens of the, the mortgage originator, the mortgage bank. How are they accessing DVO1? Are you plugging into existing capital markets or research infrastructure? Are they using your data as a, pl as a platform? Like what's, what's the, the path to working with DVO1? Actually, there's a multiple, there's a number of paths. So yes, they do use us for capital markets. Uh, we are in the deals um, as soon as they are priced. We are in the deals as a loan data agent, functioning the capacity of giving everybody broad access to the deals, not just to the raw data, but to the performative metrics that they would need to be able to analyze that that deal's performance, but not just in an aggregate as you would see with most data vendors, but down to the loan level, which is what's really needed to get down into the dirty of, of the data. Uh, we're also plugged into the issuers with some of our pre-purchase products, like our tape cracking tool, which allows originators and issuers to both buy and sell new production loans through kind of a cleansed data tape without having to transform the data themselves, send it on to issuers, um, et cetera. We can also plug in, as we've done, to the originators and the issuers in terms of their uh, lending facilities. So as they're onboarding new loans, as they're originating, they obviously need a line of credit in order to be able to continue to fund operations before getting the securitized markets. So in that sense, we work with the originator and their partner bank to create credit facility reporting. And also we have, just to finish out the thought, we are also tracking their entire suite of, of, of lending products, where some people will only look at the securitized world and say, hey, whatever your whole loan process is, that's not our business. We're in the securitized market, figure that out on, on your own. We plug in with originators and we're, we allow them to view their entirety of their portfolio, including if they have 60 portfolios and be able to dynamically compare them live, depend, regardless of how much they've securitized. All right, that's really interesting. So you're involved at the capital market stage uh, for helping issuers find liquidity on a yeah. on a whole loan basis, but yeah. also portfolio monitoring to identify where there might be soft spots or regulatory issues that like deserve some capital markets attention. Oh yeah, basically we we can't help them make the loan, but once a loan is made and they need to do something with it, whether it's warehouse it, sell it, buy it, or securitize it, we're able to plug in with their, with issuers at at each of those levels. So from an interoperability perspective, are you, you're integrated with their, their servicing platform and other capital markets tech? Like how, how do the pieces fit together? And like, do the folks at a mortgage originator that benefit from DVO one know they're using DVO one, or is this like integrated, like pure, like backend through like other capital markets tech? They, they know because they've willingly put us in the transactions. And in some cases they'll know because we, we have to inform them of where we see inconsistencies between different reporting packages, which we see all the time. Uh, unfortunately, we've noticed that the industry in some cases has had has pretty arcane reporting processes. So we are still dealing with old CSV spreadsheets and things that need a lot of uh, high touch maintenance, which is something that we do for our clients. So in that sense, we're very interactive because we're informing them of what a good practice is. And we're also interfacing with them and understanding how they personally have previously accounted for bad data from servicers or trustees or master servicers and working with them on that front. So yes, uh, in that sense, we're plugged in and we also manage that relationship they have between their own reporting and how they expect data to come in from the third parties. Interesting. And so you, you mentioned some specialties and in investor products like the, the fix and flip and the, the V2 of HELOCs and non-QM. Do you find market opportunity with kind of the 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 traditional like um, GSC focused IMB, or do you find like a uh, better like product market fit or client market fit with specialty lenders? Like, how, how does that work in the mortgage side? You know, it's interesting that I, I, I would have, if you asked me this question this time last year, the answer would have been quite different. But the banking failures that we've had in 2023, and the necessity, and I guess the fragility maybe of the purely deposit-based uh, funding model that has existed for you know many traditional financial institutions has led the way to to much more entities considering the securitized markets so today the i think the opportunities are fairly they're fair they're fairly broad-based 
but they are also coming off a very, very difficult 22 and early 23. It's despite the fact that, you know, sector performance, generally speaking, is very good, which we'll get into later. We still do have a market that had significant constraints over the better part of the past two years. So some of the innovations that we've seen in the lending side, uh, either A, just didn't get as it didn't get as much traction just because 2022 was so difficult or didn't make that leap into a institutional consistently available product in the capital market side because again 2022 was such a difficult year to me this looks to be more of a temporary process that, rather than a long-term one because for the most part we still have a very robust housing market and we still have a big need for kind of non-traditional borrowers to either one, tap, their, tap a home equity line of credit because they're not touching their 3% mortgage, or two, fund their construction or renovations because they're not selling their house because they have the 3% mortgage. So there is going to be a number of products that are available, a number of touch points for the consumer to get involved, notwithstanding the fact that the U.S. consumer just continues to be remarkably resilient in their balance sheet and their overall structure. There might be some temporary elements to this market, but I think we're also seeing that temporary elements uh, build muscle memory and and teach behavior. So yeah. the capital markets leaders that that I've interviewed for housing news and had conversations with kind of continue to reemphasize this point of a big part of their job is building out more relationships for for liquidity, and yeah. nobody is going to run their business whether they're they're focused on the the qualified side or or doing more innovative products off of a, a single investor. And like we saw the non-QM market grind to a halt in, in April of, of 2020. And um, you know, there's new business models emerging now and and new uh, capital sources emerging. And it feels like that emphasis on having multiple liquidity partners and and like backup strategies becomes an increasingly important part of how lenders of all like shapes and sizes and focuses will will run their business no one wants to be uh you know have a have key man risk on liquidity yeah and listen Clayton, to, to to your point there we have to remember our markets structured credit with large and especially the non-agency mortgage markets they're still a fraction of the size of their old true self our yeah. market has the infrastructure to handle its former size, which is measured in the trillions and the tens of trillions. We have to remember this used to be the fourth largest credit market in the world. We had more non-agency issuance in 2006 than we had agency. Now, that had its own problems, of course, we, which were well-known, well-documented, well-publicized. But those weren't fundamentally issues that the market couldn't handle. That was certainly a problem of excess in the markets, but the market structure and the amount of innovation that we had at that time, in some cases, has taken a big step back. In some ways, the problems we run into at DV01 is a legacy of the fact that we stopped getting a ton of investment after 2006 because the participants didn't have the same scale. The market didn't have the same exuberance behind it. And in some cases, that's something we need to get back to because structured credit at its core, when you strip out the excess that we had in 2006, 2007, when you get back down to what this market is, it does allow you to diversify as an investor, as an issuer, your funding source. It does allow investors to get access to high quality credit products. And a lot of the markets, notwithstanding the mortgages that were created from 2004 to 2007, they're well known, their problems were well known. But to the same point, I've told people this all the time, the auto markets how many times have we heard the story about subprime autos breaking this subprime autos this it's the next housing crisis do you know the number the dollar of loss that's been taken by rated subprime bonds in the past 20 years it's zero if you have a rated subprime bond especially i think there's been maybe one or there might have been maybe it's not zero but it's something in like the tens of millions of dollars it's tiny it's it's, it's non-existent it's been so well support. It's been so well supported. How about credit cards? Zero. Structured credit is a ve is been a tremendous vehicle of diversification, of market advancing, of by the way, creating new forms of credit for consumers to lower their bills. Um, but the market innovation sometimes has its fits and starts, and there's a lot of people that are still very scared of the market. I, I always use this quote where. The normal people will say that 2008 was 15 years ago and people in structured credit would say it's last week. That's, that's a good quote. Okay. So 
going back to that 06 period, I think you mentioned the number 4 trillion was the size of the the structured credit or uh, kind yeah. of private capital market for in in home lending at that yeah. time. Where, where give us some context to that. How has that like ebbed and flowed? Um, I mean, I know how fast it dropped off in yeah. 8, 9, 10, but give us a glimpse of where that is now and how it's evolved over the last 15 years or or 7 days if you're a structured credit. Pro. <laughs> to be honest, it's it's just been one way ebb. Um, there's been a little bit of a pickup, but I, I think four, four trillion might have been like the total if you include. Maybe it was three trillion, three to four trillion today. That number is about six hundred billion, um, okay. and it hasn't it hasn't materially budged over the past five six years. It has grown. We have seen issuance. Twenty twenty one was a growth year, but the growth was measured in the single digit billions. It wasn't measured in in the type of growth, the type of explosive growth that we were used to in the late 90s, early 2000s, even before, even before some of the major excesses that we saw from 2003 or 2004, really, to 2007, the market was still growing at tens of billions of dollars a year, if not even more than that. And that's the type of growth pace we haven't seen since then. Like, we think it's all, oh, because somebody loosened credit standards or, oh, because interest rates were kept so low for so long. We ha- it's demand. We had uh, there was something I found fascinating, which is that the percentage of loans in the mortgage markets that was made to the lowest kind of lower FICO score borrowers didn't peak in 2006. It peaked in 2000. By a long shot, it peaked in 2000. But we didn't talk about a housing crisis of 03 because there wasn't one. And at that time, you had a very healthy growth rate in and kind of private label mortgage market. You had a good mix of agency and non-agency, you had the ability to provide credit to people with a lower FICO score or with a dinged credit history. And you had the emergence of a relatively safe synthetic market. Uh, It's a completely different, and that kind of environment just hasn't been replicated since then. And I think the sector in not embracing technology and not embracing global access and not kind of pushing the narrative that it's gone past 2008, leaves itself in an unfortunately precariously weakened position of not getting back to the relevance that this market used to have. Okay, Vadim, I want to bring a little bit of context to to you and in, in your career. So I was d- doing Absolutely. some research on your path. I see you started your career in 06 at Bear. Right. So you're you're at you're right. at Bear Stearns kind of at, epicenter for the, the the credit learnings that we yeah. have um that we're talking about today and then you want to fitch so i'm not yeah. going to walk through your whole path but yeah. but tell me but tell, but tell me about bear and fitch and where you went from there and uh and i'd love to take it full circle to um the to news getting back BBL. to fitch yep yep yeah so you know honestly i um i i was working in an asset management advisory role at bear um and what i realized was that you know, you you have to take a gamble on yourself when you're early in your career. We've seen Gen Z being doing that quite a bit, and we're seeing the economic results. But I took a gamble in the sense that I felt the role that I wanted was far closer to what was being offered at Fitch, even though the salary, the name, prestige, you know, Fitch and Fitch is a great institution. In 2006, it didn't carry the name that Bear Stearns carried, um, and so, but the role was what intrigued me, and I. I took a big gamble. I I had been told some I- interesting things by mentors who said, you can't turn out an investment bank once you're working there, once they've given you an offer, you shouldn't do it, just stick with it. And I said, I just something didn't feel right. And because I took, I took a little bit of time, I wound up not going to Fitch's direct analyst program. I wound up in a very special role with a very special boss whose name is Grant Bailey. Uh, he taught me so much. He gave me access to to really dig into the data in these markets, to really understand what was going on in the market. So I got a front row seat to see just how quickly the tide in mortgage performance was turning from 2006 to 2007. Um, and from and he was honestly a great mentor and he's so great that we still keep in touch and I work with him on a consistent basis now that TVO1 is part of Fitch. Um, and at that point in early 2007, you really could start seeing the writing on the wall because the performance was getting materially worse. And I decided to go to a fund uh, that was particularly bearish on the housing market, uh, which was important to me. And that's how I went up at Tricadia, where I spent uh, the better part of 12 years um, learning the ins and outs of the mortgage market, learning 
through the lens of how to understand value when everybody else is running for the hills, and then how to translate the mortgage knowledge to understanding the consumer as a whole. Because the mortgage is the biggest piece of their balance sheet. It's the biggest market we have. It's the biggest source of wealth for the vast majority of U.S. consumers. And it has so many ripples and so many ebbs and flows in how we think about the consumer as a whole from what their activity in the mortgage market was. And from there, I kind of chose to go into the fintech route because I felt like I wanted to broaden my horizon a little bit more than the typical investment side that I was doing at Tricadia and really understand the technical side and the data delivery side and the client management expectation side and more asset classes, which DBO one has allowed me to do. Okay. So 12 years at Tricadia, how did your, which you, you mentioned initially was very yeah. bearish on housing. And, yeah. um, it, I, I, f I found a lot of housing, uh, bears have trouble, uh, shaking that persona, even when yes, the data starts to change. So like, t tell us about your kind of evolution on views at housing, you know, st watching this asset class, um, you know, almost exclusively for, yeah. for over a decade, like give us a glimpse into the data that mattered to you. If there were any points in the last cycle, um, the last week or last 15 years, uh, that, that influenced the way you felt about the market that we both like have dedicated our careers to. You know, that's a great question. And what I've noticed is that w it's often very hard to change sentiment once it's become ingrained. So once the term subprime went from an asset class to a definition of failure and the term became ubiquitous with a negative connotation with this is bad, it creates the opportunity where people just can't participate, either because they've gotten a tap on the shoulder, because it's associated with negative behavior, or it's come to symbolize something that is fundamentally toxic. Once you get to that point, the question of valuation becomes wholly rebalanced to a lesser degree. Let's let's consider this for a minute. To a lesser degree, we've kind of got a mini version of that today in the fintech startup world or in the technology world that we've seen since 2021. Once you question the idea of, hey, growth at all costs and you now want profitability and you don't have the the kind of VC capital to fund negative profitability for entire time once you change market share, what happens to valuation? Valuation becomes a kind of a tricky process at that point because you have to revalue the whole sector. That's what happened in 2008 because as quickly as mortgage delinquencies came off and as quickly as they rose, and they did rise very quickly, we went from 4% delinquency rates in the US to a peak of 11 in the first quarter of 2010. But the pricing of mortgage instruments came off at a humongous multiple of that where we went at some point, you know, you had prime deals pricing in like a lifetime default rate of something in the lifetime loss rate of in the basis points of the low 1% and the expected lifetime default rates in the single digits to 80%. And clearly the 6% was wrong, but so was the 80. And that question of once the sentiment gets negative enough, what happens is people will reinforce the negative. They'll see, a five, they'll see an increase in delinquencies of 10% and say, what if it's 50? And that's the negative, that's the connotation you'll keep having is people will keep pushing the negative scenario. And at that point, you have to take a step back and say, what does it actually look like if 80% of prime households defaulted on their mortgage in the US? Do we even have an economy standing at this point? This is the largest thing that investors, the US consumers hold. What does it mean if 80% default? That's what we didn't see in the 1930s. So you start to have to take a step back and say, what's really there? What's the impetus? What's going to happen? And how is that baked into the pricing today? Because one of the brilliant things that finance as a whole tells us is we have pricing. We're, you're going to be told what something's worth because you can transact in it. So that's reframing that narrative becomes important. And once you know, we saw a tremendous recovery in pricing in the non-agency universe after 2008. We saw an almost one-way upward move for the better part of 10 years, which kind of made a lot of career people's careers very, very fruitful. And then from there, we started to see that, hey, there were other businesses that got mothballed or that were abandoned or ignored that suddenly had value. All of a sudden, like, hey, the home builders that did go bankrupt, are we never building housing again? 
we have to. And in some ways, in, in some ways, the longer a sector takes to readjust, the longer the people's psychology takes to readjust, the more the problem that they have to fix becomes evident. For the longest time, people were saying no one wants to buy housing anymore. And, you know, all there was so much housing built on spec that there's so much excess inventory that we can't build. And what wound up happening is we built too few homes for the better part of 15 years. And what do we talk about today? We talk about we don't talk about if there's a housing shortage. We ask how many millions are we short? The exact antithesis, the exact origin of that problem is 2008. Because because investors who were, by the way, very sanguine on the home builder sector at one point, it was a very, very hot start market. That market became dry for decades. It continues to be, to a large extent, home builders continue to be a very niche investment universe. It doesn't have the attention that it had in 2006. It wasn't attractive. It didn't. It lost focus, and a lot of the that investor universe didn't come back. And when that happens, you have you know value pockets that create, and you have the ability to understand what something is truly worth. So the housing inventory shortage that we're facing right now is a very popular and very easy narrative to tell. It's a headline in in every media outlet. We recently saw um, every media outlet cover the fact that Berkshire Hathaway went went heavier on their their home builder holdings. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you think the market or the average housing professional is missing in this narrative? Or do you believe that the shortage is as strong and heavy and long standing as uh you know the cocktail hour talk seems to imply i think it's absolutely uh, i i i think the only thing that's missing in this discussion is how long the shortage has been there i think people think this is a shortage that has become recently true and in fact this shortage has been a decade in the making in fact there's actually a good argument to be made that we didn't even overbuild in the early part of the 2000s we maybe just concentrated building in a certain area and we maybe didn't build the kind of supply that people wanted, but really there's a good argument to be made that we didn't overbuild all that much at that time, but we certainly underbuilt. We certainly overlearned the lesson. So I think the narrative is, is, is very true. Um, perhaps the things that are, that are, that are misunderstood is that people believe it's a switch that, hey, if you're underbuilding housing, just go build more housing. But th this is an industry. Industries don't get made in a quarter. They don't get made in a year. Uh, there is, for, for lack of a better term, <laughs> there's an interesting anecdote that the most, the, the last useful innovation or last sh shifting innovation in housing was the electrical, you know, the electric tools uh, in terms of building, which is obviously a, a joke, but it's very hard to just say, hey, we're going to double housing supply. Where are you going to get the land? How are you going to get the permit? The permitting process has become way more expensive, way more difficult. And that's not limited to the usual culprits of California and New York. Permitting costs have skyrocketed almost everywhere in the nation, particularly states with actually some of the lower tax bills because they have some of the highest permitting costs. Uh, there's questions of land entitlement. There's environmental impact. And there's the other questions of if you build housing in a certain area, is it any useful if there's no infrastructure around that area? So this is a commitment that gets solved over the course of years and decades. So we built this shortage over decades. We can't expect to unwind it in a year or two. This is dedicated, committed processing. And on top of that, it's a commitment to infrastructure building to support said housing, including, by the way, green infrastructure, because now we're building towards a climate future. So there's a whole skew of consider slew of considerations that we have to bake in. So the talk about how big the shortage is, it's, it, it's important and it's important to us to recognize, but it's also how long it took to build, how much time it's going to take to unwind and how much impact this has kind of for, for the nation overall. I mean, you know, we what, can't we just yeah, convert all these office buildings to residential? Isn't that a quick fix? Yeah, definitely. Of course. <laughs> Let's convert everything. Okay. I, okay, I, I mean, I, I do joke about that, but there is, you know, the hot topic today was, hey, let's convert, let's convert all of this. And it's, a, you know, good media talk point. But the seven, six years ago, the topic was let's convert all the class C malls into multifamily yep. and the strip malls. By the way, not the worst idea. There isn't enough land. Build it.
Okay, so let's talk about the relationship between a housing shortage, home building, and and home price appreciation. So we know it's not a quick flip, quick fix. We can't flip a switch. So yep. how do you tie out expected impact on home prices and affordability with where we stand with the inventory we have today? That's a great question. So the the question then is going to be: Is affordability primarily a function of rates, or is it primarily a function of prices? Clearly, it's both. But the recent, you know, surge in affordability has been mainly driven by rates. And the reason we can say that is because in the end of 2021 or the middle of 2021, affordability ratio is about 25% nationwide. And that's right. That's even at the lower end. That's pretty close to that low end that we saw in the mid 1990s. It wasn't the record low we saw, which was in the 2020s. Absolutely. For the past 50 years, the best affordability year you saw was in the early mid 2010s. And it's unlikely we can get back to that point. And that was around 20, 21%. We got up to 25. So was it materially worse, even though by that point, not only had we cleared all the declines from 2007, we'd way exceeded 2007 price by that point. So the move since then hasn't been about home prices appreciation, which has been fairly, it's been there, it's not negative, but it certainly hasn't been astounding and it hasn't even been above the growth of income. What has been there is a change in rates. And it's been massive. We've gone from three, four percent rates, which, by the way, the vast majority of homeowners are still locked in at, to to seven percent. We've gone from historic lows to historic averages in the course of eighteen months. We haven't seen this kind of rapid rate increase in 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 ages. And if we had a more balanced inventory situation, we probably would have seen home price declines, but we don't. And the the amount of shortage that we have coupled with by the way with a very very substantial and understated growth in median income across the u.s coupled with a very large desire for home ownership because on an adjusted basis the home ownership today we have is pretty close to record highs it's hard to square the circle of this idea that we've got this massive amount of home price appreciation to do just because we're going to build a bunch of new homes I heard Jim Egan from Morgan Stanley recently on a podcast, which kind of confirms our own data, say that about 80% of U.S. homeowners don't have a rate incentive to refi if rates fall to 4%. 80%. This is um, this is 80%. I mean, we have 80-something million homeowners in America. So 64, 65 million of them are locked in at low rates. And on top of that, that's only of the people that have mortgages. 38, 38% of homes are owned outright in cash. So... This idea of a plunge in home prices would be predicated on the idea of a massive amount of supply. Where is this massive supply coming from? We haven't built we haven't built enough homes to clear out new household formations. If you adjust for you know depreciation that happens about 200,000 units a year, we haven't built enough homes to meet household formations in 13 years. So it's so in order to square the affordability question, you're going to have to build supply. You're going to have to build affordable supply. And that's going that is a very, very difficult question. It's not you don't just plop down affordable supply and say, hey, I have affordable housing. This is going to be a lot of choices that are made by investors, by builders, by borrowers, by local entities at the state, city, and even federal level. So another popular narrative has been this on the same theme, right? Of the supply and demand imbalance. How, how do you measure demand? And, and I want to kind of take that to the to the to the angle that you've given us a glimpse into your views on the strength of the the Gen Z and millennial housing market or economic participant. So, how do we get a glimpse for the demand from this like first time homeowner base who, for the most part, has been sidelined over the the last three and a half years? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way that we can think about demand is in a few ways. Number one, obviously, let's look at, we can first look at what are the home buying trends or what are the trends at the youngest generation? Are they not buying because they don't want to? Or are they not buying because they can't? Well, what we've seen is Gen Z has recovered in home ownership rates to an astounding degree. Not only are they at their record highs, they also got to those record highs in a pretty rapid fashion. So today we're looking at their home ownership rates around 25, 26%. In the 80s, that was maybe 20, 21%. But in the in the aughts, in the 2010, 2011, because younger people were hit disproportionately harder by the recession, got down to 13, 14%. So it really, really hit maybe 15%. So it really rose quite substantially. If you look at a lot of surveys, people do find homeownership to be 
one of the strongest paths to income mobility and wealth building. Um, there's no great evidence in suggesting what people would say about millennials all the time, which is that they don't want to own homes. There's no great evidence to say they don't want to. There's great evidence to say they couldn't. But Dean, I think you and I, yeah. I think you and I finished college around the around the same time, and I, when those headlines started popping up, like I was 22 in my first job, and they're and like saying like millennials would never buy a home. I was like, I'm not an old millennial, and like, yeah. like this is like these th those headlines were popping way too early. Like it, they totally didn't take into account the fact that like half the generation is still living under their parents' roof because there's juniors in college or juniors yeah. in high school. It, like it, it's it, that was a that was a ridiculous news cycle. It was, and we have to remember that it, it was coming from a time. It, it, it was coming from a time that now, looking back a decade later, looks historically comical because we couldn't properly understand the magnitude of what was suffered. But it's hard to understate the magnitude of what millennials went through in 2008 because this recession unquestionably hit the millennial generation really, really hard. To a parable, how much time is being spent today talking about China's record youth unemployment rate? And how much will this re resonate throughout that society for the next decade? We were living that in real time. We had unemployment rate, yeah, we hit 10% nationwide, but what was the youth six rate for youth? It was soaring. We didn't get to pre-crisis, pre-2007 unemployment for younger households until 2017. And if you had youth six, it probably wasn't, uh, wasn't until 2018. Um, not to mention, that where they did have the economic opportunities, because it wasn't spread out, we didn't have a national recovery from 2008. We had very localized recoveries. And those localized recoveries happened to have been concentrated in some of the cities that have the biggest problem with affordability, the biggest problem with housing shortages. And also, you know, because of that, diversified economic opportunities. So a lot of people moved to New York and San Francisco for jobs and figured out that, oh my God, housing is very unaffordable here. <laughs> We have a we have a national home ownership rate in the U.S. of 66 percent today, on a on an adjusted basis. That's pretty close to record highs, like I mean all time record highs. So all this generation talk about hey boomers bought their house and Gen Z didn't. Boomers had a lower home ownership rate than, than millennials do today. Um, so that's not really the the, the, the truth of the narrative. Despite, despite the fact that we have a much bigger housing shortage today, instead there were differing amounts of economic opportunities on a national level, far more so than occurred after 2008, which I think people understate just how fundamentally the nation was scarred and how long it took to bounce back in 2008 and how that bounce back was very, very concentrated. So again, I said 66% home ownership rate in the US. New York County, it's 23. So and New York County got a lot of millennials. So when you say they don't they don't want to own a home, well, can they afford to where they're moving? San Francisco has what twenty eight percent home ownership rate. So this is the challenge. Millennials can't afford to own a home in the areas that they're working. But one thing that did change is you saw a lot more economic mobility, and you saw a lot more cities popping up with economic opportunities over the past six, seven years, and that in some ways really accelerated after COVID. Um, in fact, some of the move outs were occurring in some of the highest cost cities. So in that sense, yeah, you have a lot more wealth of kind of economic opportunities, which allow a lot more people to buy homes, which by the way, is one of the reasons why we've seen the home ownership rate go up so much, especially among younger people. All right, Vadim, let's shift over and talk about today's mortgage market. So through DVO1, you are you're you're tracking lenders, you're tracking the market. What yeah. trends are you starting to see emerge in terms of products that may be gaining market share? We we understand that purchase origination volumes are down, but there yeah. are some shifts happening in in mix. So give us a glimpse into what you're seeing in terms of market share and product uh concentration. Absolutely. So we'll we'll start with the fact that for the most part, the originator model, which by the way, there were a lot of people hired for mortgage origination over the past three years, and a lot of those people have to have things to do. If you're not going to wholesale, lay all of them off. What typically happens if you have an environment like 2020, where everybody can make money on making an agency loan, you don't make non-QM. You don't make difficult loans, because why? Why do you need to? You can make agencies and you can make your money off refinancing. What we have seen is there is clear demand 
from the mortgage origination side to originate to borrowers that maybe couldn't have gotten in the door because of supply constraints over the past couple of years. Um, there's the demand for that. There's also the demand to address the, again, the record home ownership, the record home equity rate today, and the fact that so many borrowers are locked into a loan that they're not going to get rid of. Their loan is probably worth just as much as their house, if not more. So what does that mean? That means we can tap into their home equity, we can tap into a second lien product, and we can tap into a related product. So maybe you fund a reconstruct, you know, you fund upgrades through your HELOC. Maybe you get a loan from a personal you know, personal lender that is based a little bit on the refinancing project. Maybe what you do is if you're buying a home today, because there's just not the supply of, hey, new homes available that are easy to buy. Maybe what you're buying is a bit of a fix and flip property. So you see the growth in the RTL market, which was a big, big growth driver in 20, uh, 2021. Not, not big in the dollar of market share. Obviously, it doesn't touch the mortgage market, but it was a significant growth industry. Um, we and the thing is the tailwinds for those haven't gone away uh they haven't disappeared what they suffered was from in 2022 was a record change in funding structures that necessitated a re-need to think about the business model so if the funding structures massively shifted the access to the securitized markets was significantly worse so a lot of those trends were more just put on pause because you couldn't get to the market as easy as you could in 2021. You went from a massively tight environment in 2020 to massively loose one in 21 to massively tight one in 22. Usually cycles like this, they take 10 years. We've had a rapidly, rapidly consolidated credit cycle over the past three years, which takes time to adjust for market participants. So the trends for home equity, they're still there. The trends for RTL loans, they're still there. And we're starting to see more and more market participants talk about them and participants uh, you know, make use of them. But it's going to take time. The last time we had a big amount of home equity loans in the market was 2008 and people remember how those turned out. Um, so, and honestly, the one thing about 2008 and home equity, you didn't actually see a ton of pure on credit-based home equity products available to investors. Most of the home equity securitizations that were done were, were uh, insured. So the monoline insurers, which kind of talk about relics of the past, um, they insured a lot of that market. And so a lot of the loans just didn't hit, you know, private credit segments at all. So there isn't a ton of experience. It's going to take some time for both investors to get confident with the data to and issuers getting confident coming to the securitization market versus the bank balance sheet market. It's going to take some innovation because HELOCs are notoriously difficult to fund because of the erratic stream of payments and draws. So it's going to take some time for markets to find the right kind of balance for what they need from this product. And once we get there, there's there's absolutely ample opportunity for growth. Um, but of course, what you are going to be facing, which is inescapable, is the fact that you have a much higher interest rate environment today. A lot of times you don't consumers don't think in a nominal basis. They don't think in a relative to inflation basis. What they see is they got a mortgage at 4% before, and now their mortgage is 8 Maybe they don't want to buy the house. Or with a house, you kind of make that decision. That's more of a mandatory rather than uh, a voluntary decision. But when it there's comes the, to There's the economic like, and financial decision, and there's also the psychological decision. Correct. The, 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 the people like to brag about interest rates for some reason. Correct. But when it comes to, hey, do you want to renovate? Well, maybe you wanted to renovate when the HELOC was 4%, but maybe you don't want to pay a 9% HELOC for renovating. So there's going to be a lot of decisions that are going to be made off that front. There's also going to be a lot of in consumer and investor psychology that still needs to translate from a zero interest rate environment to a very, very high positive interest rate environment. Again, just as it, how long did it take us to change the business practices from 2007, which is a decently high interest rate environment to a zero interest rate environment like we had 2009 to 2021. It didn't happen right away. It didn't. It's not like we flipped a switch and all of a sudden people are like, hey, zero rate, rate environment. Great. Businesses are open. Let's go start hiring. Let's go start taking, you know, it took years. It took years. We've built a business model over the course of a decade on low interest rate environment. It doesn't unwind in a year. It doesn't unwind in this snap of our fingers. So in a lot of ways, 
the same kind of headwinds that you know the same kind of headwinds that are created from a higher rate environment is also kind of a tailwind to the future of once you adjust your business model are the fundamental structures still there is there still the demand is there still the need to do these things there absolutely are there is the demand for HELOCs unquestionably from borrowers we just don't know the degree and we don't know the degree based on interest rates so a lot of the innovations that we've seen in the market have a longer tail to run and they've been more paused than halted permanently by 2022 so we feel like there's a bitty big runway for them to advance over the coming years it's just probably not going to be the explosive kind of growth that maybe people are expecting of one to two hundred percent per year every year four or five years probably that's not happening but i hope the investor and consumer sentiment gets there because the originator interest is there i can search yeah. housing wire right now and find 20 top 50 originators who did were not in the home equity game 12 months ago that are have yeah. now launched a product or in process of launching a product and yeah. some of their projections on how big they think those home equity business will get are you know relatively uh aggressive and um so hopefully that's founded in data and founded in investor and consumer sentiment which yeah. will ultimately drive the outcome absolutely Okay, Vadim, so we, we started hitting on this thread. I just want to bring one thread to completion here. Yeah. So you, in 07, joined, joined Fitch. Now, um, DBO one is part of Fitch Solutions. Uh, that That's was announced right. about a year ago. So give us a glimpse into how the last year has gone, um, integration, any any new capabilities that have been brought to clients. So give us give us a glimpse into how this is playing out. You know, honestly, it's been, it's been a wonderful year. Uh, We've gotten exposure to the Fitch knowledge base of so many different uh, products, and we are realizing there's so many more products, not just in the U.S., but globally, that really need the kind of data intelligence that, that we're providing. And what we're noticing is Fitch has so much expertise in so many different markets, and, there's, and we're finding a lot of ways to sync up. We're finding a way to make their loss model more accessible so that investors can have a great understanding of what, a, what their expected losses are going to be on a pool before they even even if as they're making the pool purchase process. Um, so there are a lot of lo short, medium, long-term innovations that, that we're looking at to, again, bring more transparency, bring more certainty, and bring more kind of, I guess, bring forward the structured credit markets in the ways that they hadn't really been, you know, been brought forward before. But the important thing for us is DVO, and we were in fintech. Fintechs have a certain kind of startup culture, and there's a certain kind of, Hey, you want to move, you want to move real fast and you want to break things. And, and that doesn't always exist in, in, in the large, in the larger institutions. So the one thing that's been important for us and the one thing that we stress during the merge is we want to keep the DVO on culture. And I can safely say after a year, we absolutely have kept the DVO on culture. Like we are still moving fast. We're still, you know, we're still breaking things here and there, um, as, as fintechs want to do, um, so in that sense, it's been it's been a really positive experience. It's it's honestly been a lot of learning. It's been a lot of figuring out where we can fit, where we can kind of join to do things, and how we can transform business models over over a longer term. And kind of starting to put ideas on pen to paper and all that. So it's been honestly quite exciting, and it's been great to re to interact with my old boss. That's excellent. All right. Vadim, I appreciate it so much. Folks, our, our Housing News listeners, at the beginning of this episode, we gave you a little preview of what to expect at Housing Wire Annual this year, which is coming up on October 10th. This is our mortgage industry conference. And today's conversation with Vadim is actually structured very similar to the, the topics and content that we're going to be talking about at our, our in-person event in Austin. We're going to be talking about housing market trends and product trends, uh, servicing, capital markets, liquidity, tech. I really hope if you enjoyed this episode, join us at Housing Wire Annual because this is the exact type of content that we're bringing to the stage. Vadim, I'd love for you to join us and extending you the invite right now. So hopefully I get to meet great. you in person in Austin. I, I love this conversation. Learned, learned a ton from you. Sounds great. Hey, Clayton, I, I appreciate the insightful questions. I, I appreciate the way that the conversation went. Uh -huh.